Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Stephen Gilpin, who is Head of Performance and Medical at Rotherham United. So Stephen, thanks for joining. Looks like you're you at the training ground, I'm presuming there. Yeah, so uh, afternoon of match day. So just at the training ground, we've got a couple of injured boys in this afternoon um, before we head over to our stadium for a pre-match meal. And then we're playing Sheffield United at Bramall Lane tonight. So tough game for us, tough game. Oh, nice. Right. So, yeah, you've actually got a game tonight. I feel very privileged then to get the uh, the pre-match atmosphere going. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's always one of those on a on an evening midweek game where it's a, it can feel like a long build-up, a long game. When you're generally playing away, you can be in a hotel and, you know, sat around in, in meeting rooms or, or hotel rooms or physio rooms for long periods. But generally, when we play the closer games, we, we like to keep the players at home for as long as we can. So, it gives me an opportunity to really focus on the injured boys, get them in one on one, no distractions with the rest of the group, and then really dust off the day, get down to pre match, and then it's all all geared up towards the game. Then, so the lads will join us. We'll have food three and a half hours before the game. Uh, the gaffer will have an opportunity to talk to the players individually or in groups, and then we'll we'll get on the team bus and we'll head over to Bramall Lane tonight and uh, try and get a positive result. Right. So, what time did you would have started today? Then, what time were you in? So this morning I was up and I was on from home emails from about half past eight, um, a few phone calls. One thing that you generally realise in, in football and sport is that your phone is off in your office and your phone, I always say I'm contactable as of the day. You just have to be. I just, I've just i always tried to think, is there a way you can try and create cutoffs or or points where you, you, you're not contactable? I just don't think it works. I, I really don't. I, I think for me to do everything I need to do from a, a performance, from a physio, from a management, from a leadership role with staff, with players, I've, I've got to be that point of contact. So, yeah, so up this morning on emails, on calls, um, got in here mid-morning, um debrief with some of the staff who are in we just had a review on uh, we've had some scans come back from the weekend uh starting to plan early stages of rehab and and where that might lead us over the next world cup break um then there's a few kind of wider things i'm discussing with the board and the club and the stakeholders we've got a trip out uh, in a couple of weeks to cyprus for a mid-season break so i'm trying to make sure that from a a team perspective everything out there is set up for us how we need it from a training uh, conditioning and and then also the, the more uh, hotel facility side of it as well. So yeah, lots going on this morning. Then we we had a a bite to eat before the lads came in. Players in early afternoon, uh, assessments, plans, and now uh, into the bulk of the rehab and, and afternoon sessions with uh, some of the staff here. We've got Calamard Sports uh, Sports Rehab in and Dom Ray uh, Senior Physio. We've also got. Uh, we've got Brent in working with the guys in the gym. He's our senior performance coach and Ryan, our, our first team sports scientist. So we are generally in this afternoon kind of just get a, a good number of staff in to work with the boys and, and try and get some uh, some good work done. Right. And then so what do the, the non-injured people do now then? Are they, do they stay at the training ground until they leave? So the, the non-injured boys are um, at home currently. So the ones who are in the squad for tonight, they'll be they'll be resting at home. And the first time they have to report isn't until the pre-match meal. So, like I said, that's the beauty of playing a game tonight, which is so close. We can keep players at their at their homes for longer. For me, you know, if we if we dragged them in this afternoon, or if we did a say a day beds that we do a lot of the time for such a close fixture, I, I just I'd rather keep them with them with their families. Um, have a a usual prep as if it was a home game, and then bring them together for the for the food and and go from there. So is that something that so you're making that within your role? You make that decision to do that. Is that I presume other clubs will do it differently to that? Yeah. So generally, it's a conversation with myself and the manager and, and how we like to work. We we think about loads of different factors. That it might be location, it might be uh, the team we're playing, it might be the schedule. We we try and strategically plan how we create freshness and a, a slight performance advantage when we come to the game. So, you know, there might be times where we have a Tuesday night fixture down in London and we might want to travel on a Monday evening. But what we've also got to remember is that that makes it an awfully long day on a Tuesday where you've got players sat in hotel rooms, potentially doing things they wouldn't do as if it was a normal build up to a home game. So there's loads of conversations we have around how should we tackle this? Um, and it generally is, yeah, a discussion with myself and the manager and, and how we might um, go about each game, game by game. Yeah, no, there is there's a lot of non-clinical stuff to consider, isn't there? And that we, we were talking about financial 
things beforehand is that ever does that ever come up in terms of deciding what you might want to do in terms of traveling to places or, or whatever it does there's always that financial you know aspect or umbrella over every decision you make and that's from the top to the bottom of the game you know just because i'm talking about whether we should be in a hotel today in sheffield is the same conversation that a man city might be having whether they fly or take the coach down to London or, you know, every club, it's just different conversations on a different scale. So there's always an element where you consider the finance and the club give us very clear direction in terms of what that might look like. And once you've been in an organisation for a period of time, you start to learn what is the, you know, the expectation, what what the chairman has in terms of a, a budget or a remit for those things. And, you know, there are times where we go, right, this is a a pinch point in the fixture calendar where we need to maybe stretch the budget to do something a little bit different to create a different response. And that can then be supported financially from the club. Um, we might travel in different ways. Instead of getting the coach, we may get the train. We may break up the journey. We may train at a different location on the way down to a long, a long away game. If it was like a Swansea or uh, a Bristol city or or someone, you know, further afield, we, we may look to train on, on route. We may also look to stay in hotels after evening games so that the players get into their bed quicker. We know that from a, a recovery modality, we want players to sleep. Um, so we have loads of different um, factors and, and decisions which make up a an evening prep. And there is a financial aspect which limits you or, or also, you know, it, it's it's each club to their own, really. Mm, yeah, there's loads to consider, isn't it? So so once you and the manager have made that decision then, so in terms of the implementation of whatever the operational and logistics that you need to sort, have you got a team that you would disseminate that they organise all that? Yeah, so we use, we've got a chief operation officer. Um, we've also got um, a uh, travel logistics hotel agent, external company that we use. So we will disseminate all the information of how we want the travel to look, the timings, the quality of hotel will we'll be supplied with a list of maybe three or four hotels and we'll pick which one we think is appropriate from a, a facilities, a location, a, you know, sometimes even superstition from managers. It, it's as simple as that. Um, and we'll disseminate that information to all those people. There'll be a rubber stamp from the club from the finance and then that will then be organised given back to us as a as a logistics plan, which we then distribute to the players and the rest of the staff. Really interesting. No, it's really interesting. So is it is it EFL for you guys tonight? The cup? Or is it league? No, 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 just the championship fixture. So we actually um this is a rearranged fixture of ours. So this was the fixture we were supposed to play um when the uh Queen um passed away. So there was the it was the weekend where all sporting fixtures were cancelled. So this is a rearranged game for us where this was going to be a free week. So it was going to be a Saturday to Saturday build up which has now turned into a midweek fixture. And then we play away at Luton on Saturday. So it's just been a little bit of a reschedule, a, a, a condensed fixture period for us where we're, we're playing every, you know, three, four days. It's very, very tough. So, yeah, it's a normal championship game tonight. Right. And then just going back to what you said before about basically your phone being in your office. Like, did you, I can, and I pretty much know the answer to this, but do you ever have a day where you're not in communication with, with people? No, you, you just can't. You really can't. And, and you'll speak to people across the game on this one. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, it is the industry. It's a 24-7 it's a industry where players and the organisation, you know, there isn't a switch off point from it. And you have to be contactable. There's always people that you need to be communicating with. There's always uh conversations or, or things that that have to continue and, ha and have to run and I, i've you know like i said on previously like if you try and have this cutoff period i can assure you there'll be things that are then missed or or potential you know negative consequences to that so you are yeah you are contactable at all hours but that is part and parcel of the job you can't moan about it you can't you know, gr have gripes about it. It's what you sign up for. It is the role. It is the industry, and 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 that's what and that's part and part and parcel of the job. Yeah, no, we we had this. We had our team meeting yesterday. We were bringing up certain things that you're like, oh, and then it's like, yeah, well, that's what's going to happen. You know, in this particular context, if that if you're in the world of whether it's medical technology or treating people in a football team, that's what it is. You choose to do it. It's up to you, isn't it? Really, if you you want to 
go down that route. I uh, know that's really interesting. Well, good luck tonight anyway. That'll be um, that'll yeah. be a tough game. Tough game. Yeah. So then getting back to you then. So where are you from originally? So I'm from Winchester in Hampshire, so right down south. Um, and I've almost uh, become, uh, I suppose, emigrated to, to South Yorkshire through my career, really. I, I seem to have come up here to study and, and never left, really. <laughs> So when you were growing up then in Winchester then, was this world always something that you wanted to do? Um, I had a huge interest and passion for sport, um, not just football, wide variety, multi-sport. Loved, came from a family that encouraged me and my uh, my brother to to play, be active, you know, members of many, many different clubs. Loved it, loved competing, loved going to watch professional sport, whether that be cricket, rugby, football, um, tennis played the lot um, and I kind of had that passion through school where I thought, you know what, people always said to me, try and find a passion or something that you enjoy. And if you can make it a job, it'll never feel like a job. Um, and I come from a very professional background of family where, you know, university and, uh, and you know, very much professions and, and vocations were kind of like everyone in my extended family so doctors you know it might be medical professions it might be um, teachers law so there was ingrained to me that that was the kind of the pathway to follow um, which I was always on board with because at school I was quite academic and enjoyed school enjoyed studying enjoyed that side of it but always had a passion my passion my enjoyment was sport so I thought right how how can I combine you know maybe turning this into a profession and making it feel not like a job and, and that's what I tried to do and and I had a very clear mindset from from day one that if I wanted to choose physiotherapy as a career path because I toyed with doing medicine uh, my brother's a doctor my brother's a cardiologist and I thought my skill set and my personality was more suited to being a little bit more hands-on a little bit more practical um, so I thought how can I is there a job that is medical in its nature which might allow me to be more hands-on more creative uh, a little bit more, you know, um, practical. And physiotherapy was one that came to mind. Um, I received physiotherapy as a, a, you know, for sports injuries and always looked at the physios that I saw and thought, this is a pretty cool job. Um, so I looked into it a bit more and, and knew that it was an avenue to working in sport, knew that it was an avenue to combining, you know, sporting enjoyment with a with a profession i was never good enough as a as a junior athlete to make it in any sport as a as a player so the next best thing for me was to to be part of a an extended backroom network mm. so at what point then did you think physio that's that's what i'm going to go for so i remember quite clearly it was it was um when i was getting i was around 14 15 and i knew that i had to choose my options for my a levels and I was quite lucky in a way because I, I, I quite clearly thought, right, I think physio might be the one for me because I knew that then my choices had to be quite science related in terms of studying biology, chemistry, physics, A level to allow me to then apply to the universities um, and be accepted. So I think one thing I would say is that when I speak to students and, you know, it's very difficult as a 14, 15, 16 year old to be making those life decisions. But really, it is important because if you you know, say, for example, get to 17 or 18 and then decide, oh, I wish I'd, I fancy doing physio. Unfortunately, if you haven't done a, a biology as an A-level or a science, a science um, you know, as one of your choices, you then can't apply to, to get into it as a university option. So making that decision at 14, 15 was crucial to me because I could gear up everything I did and every decision I made was shaped around going to university um, to do physio and then building a career off the back of that. So I was quite focused and quite specific from that young age so then I yeah went to did my A-levels got the grades I needed to highlighted the universities I wanted to apply to and went from there. That that definitely sounds very very focused very mature but a great way to do it it's just uh, most people at 14 and 15 can speak absolutely for me even about even about 10 years on after that I was still struggling as to what you want to do so it's really good if you can if you can have that focus and like you say it's just it's a it's a very Sim not simple but simple pathway well i found it in a, in then a later aspect in my career whereby the, the because i was so focused and i knew i wanted to do physio i knew that i had to make choices on courses which then allowed me to get into physiotherapy but then also because i knew i wanted to work in sport i knew from being an undergraduate student how to target to try and get myself into this very difficult industry to break into because i know that there are physios that maybe wake up one day 
when they're 15 years into a career and go, oh, I fancy working in sport now. But then it's it's an industry which is very hard to penetrate at even for experienced practitioners that are 10 to 15 years in if they have no prior experience. And you find that there's either a massive salary cut that has to happen in terms of getting in then at a lower end, or there has to be an unbelievable break in terms of networking or, or knowing the right people. So because I knew from a, a young age at university that I wanted to work with, with elite athletes, didn't have to be football, um, I could target getting in at that lower rung or lower tier um, to enable me to then have a, a long or a, or a kind of like a pathway to career. So again, I think that planning or that focus that I had has enabled me to probably get to the point I have now, um, you know, without relatively having to take big sideward steps or backward steps or kind of have to really rethink how I get into different areas, I'd say. Mm. Is there any point of you throughout any of that, have you thought, God, I've actually been too single minded here where I should have considered other things? Yeah, I've always like always throughout, I've always um, sports medicine and, 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 and going and doing that medical degree was always the big caveat to me all throughout my undergraduate thinking should i've should i've gone and done medicine should i've gone and done medicine and you know i i find it it's always been that that one with me that has been the toy but it's a, such a close myriad of the two um and luckily in my profession now i speak to doctors all the time so um i guess there's a huge amount of crossover in what i do so no i think i think i don't sit here with any regrets of being so single-minded i certainly don't sit here and think gosh i wish i'd have just seen how it had played out or maybe been a bit more laid back or broader minded because yeah I just think that maybe some opportunities I wouldn't have jumped on or maybe I would have, have missed the missed the opportunity to to get into certain things. Yeah and so when you were picking where to do the physio how did how did you manage to choose where you did? So um, again sport was a major aspect for me so I looked at the universities that um, offered really good uh, sporting opportunities facilities uh, looked at the big universities that were that had good reputation for physiotherapy. So that was Birmingham, Nottingham, uh, Cardiff, Sheffield Hallam um, uh, and Brighton were the ones I looked at. Um, and they were the universities. And I went and looked around them all, liked them all. They were the ones I chose. They offered, uh, yeah, like I said, good facilities from a, a physio point of view, good facilities um, from a from a sport point of view. And um, yeah, I wasn't in the mindset I had to be close to home. I, I was quite uh, open to moving away and having a fresh chapter and, and living away from home. And I, I didn't have to be close to, you know, I can only be an hour away from, you know, from parents and family. I was, you know, I suppose quite mature for a 17, 18 year old wanting to, I suppose, flee the nest a little bit. Um, and that, they were my options. And I interviewed and, and got accepted and and uh, had a choice and ended up choosing Sheffield Hallam. Do you remember why you chose that? I was really impressed with the physio school. Um, and I'll never forget. And it was um, interviews I had. And I remember going down to Brighton and it was incredible. And I, I'll never forget the woman that um, interviewed me. And she said, why do you want to be a physio? Um, and they expected the very textbook answer of, oh, I want to come in with a, an open mindset. You know, it's a broad profession. You can have respiratory care. You can have acute medicine. You can work in, you know, uh, you know, stroke care. You know, there's MSK. There's a small adjunct of sport somewhere in there. And I think I went in and quite naively, I said something like, oh, I want, I'd like quite like to work in sport. And she went and, and she took a bit, a little bit of offence to it, I think. I think she said something along the lines of, you do realise you'll never run on at Old Trafford. We have a million people say that. And it always has stuck in my head that this woman told a 17-year-old that he would never run on at Old Trafford and effectively would never work in sport. And I thought that was quite a damning comment as if to say, oh, I have all these young you know, people come in and sit here and say they want to work in sport or football. You do realise that you know, <laughs> you're a million miles off doing that. And really, I want people to come in and say, I want to work in, you know, the NHS or the hospital setting or what and I just said look that's that's I'm telling you what my interests are and my prof professions are so straight away I mean I got an offer from Brighton but I didn't entertain going there one bit um and I'd be interested to know if anyone this actually listens is from Brighton Uni or anything connected to it but my decision to not go to Brighton University was purely based off that one individual saying that comment back to me um and when I went to Sheffield Hallam I it was an it's an amazing sporting university and the facilities were amazing I got a really good feel for it and yeah that was one of the reasons it was a great city as well amazing city um loads to do very student-based city two universities 
Um, and that was uh, part of my decision making. Isn't that just crazy that that just one comment or something like that is that you literally stayed with you for however long and it's just like it does yeah. seem like a crazy thing to say to anyone. Well, yeah, I mean, like 12, 13, what is it, four years on now, I still can recount that in my head almost word for word and picture the moment she said that to me. And I, I think sometimes I've used it as a bit of a motivation to kind of almost go, you know, this stuff you a little bit, I'll prove you wrong. I think it's unfair to 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 box or limit 17 year olds in terms of what their aspirations or limitations might be. Um, so yeah, stuck with me for a long time. Yeah. So then when you got to Sheffield, how was that experience? Amazing, amazing. Like going from a, uh, a, a small city like Winchester and, you know, quite a sheltered upbringing, I suppose. You got the big bright lights of Sheffield, amazing experience. University was brilliant for me, met loads of friends, um, played field hockey at uni, amazing society, loads of socials, loads of drinking, loads of, um, you know, the occasional lecture missed <laughs> here, there and, and whatnot, but loved it, absolutely loved uni, um, uh, was was fantastic, the physio was good, um, three years of meeting some really good people, good placements, saw every aspect of physio. So like I said, even though I knew I wanted to probably work with athletes and be in sport, I went into it with an open mind. I did the respiratory placements. I did the acute medicine wards. I did the community-based placements, enjoyed them, but always knew that it wasn't quite me. Um, so then when I was at, when I was at university, I sort of sought out it was Sheffield Wednesday at the time, had an internship program. Uh, Paul Smith was the head physio. Um, and I was accepted on to do a, a year long internship with the first team at Sheffield Wednesday. And I thought, and it was just my pure single mindedness to know that, and it wasn't that I targeted football. It was just that there was an opportunity there for an undergraduate student to go and have an immersive experience for a, for a year long placement. And I thought, what a great opportunity to go and see what sports like and see what football is like. Um, whilst studying, whilst not having the financial pressures of, you know, being a postgraduate, um, being able to work for free um, and and being able to do that. And again, I think that's one of the lucky things I could do is that you can kind of get away with that as a student a little bit. You don't have those family commitments at the time. You don't have the, the wider pressures of life. So I could go in really every day off I had. I was at Sheffield Wednesday. I was there all the time, um, learn about the industry, uh, was around a first team environment at a club that was on the up um, and yeah that was that was kind of my undergraduate experience. Yeah that must have been amazing going in well the age say probably 20 odd or whatever it is that you're going in and doing that and so what was that experience like then with like the players and like, did they embrace you coming in or what's it like? Did yeah you get it's straight away. It's, it's tough it's tough and it's it's a uh, you're going into a, an alpha male um elite sport pinnacle of performance environment where everyone is you know clambering on each other to be you know the best it's it's a it's a competitive um ruthless environment it takes no prisoners and as a young like you said 20 year old it can be daunting and it opens your eyes a lot and i grew up so quick in that year and then in the early years of my career because you see so much, you see what players are like, you see what the interactions are like, you see what the environment, like you see how ruthless it is, you see winning and losing, you see how it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not for fun. It's, it's people's job. It's people's livelihoods. It's, it's serious stuff. Um, it's great fun. It is some brilliant moments along the way, amazing stories, uh, you know, some that I probably can't share on here, which is just eye opening as hell. But um, yeah, what a great thing for a young lad to be able to do. I had to interview for it. And, and luckily I got given the opportunity because it, it just reaffirmed for me. I saw the good, the bad. I realized it wasn't, you know, this necessarily this sexy, glamorous environment. And I think as a young 20 year old, it was really important for me to learn that football from the outside probably looks really sexy and glamorous and loads of money and you know you're, you're in five-star hotels and you're on luxury buses and you've got chefs that travel with you and you're on planes but you learn as a 20 year old that even in the champion championship which at Sheffield Wednesday were it's not sexy all the time it's not glamorous and it was great humbling experience to know right if you want this it's graft it's long hours it's hard work it's 
sacrifice. It's weekends away. It's Saturdays on the road. It's 2, 3 a.m. Um, back at the training ground. It's sleeping over at training grounds if you're in the next morning. It's That's what it is. And, you know, coming out of that, I knew there wasn't one part of me didn't want it to be a career. That's brilliant, isn't it? Like, what were your, like, your um, course mates, what did they make of it for you doing that? Yeah, they were obviously they they knew it was a, a great opportunity, and they were they um I think uh, a lot of them maybe didn't have the sporting interest, but the ones that did certainly thought, wow, you uh, you've got a great opportunity there to to go and see what sports like. And I didn't take it for granted. I knew that I had a privileged position to be going in to a first team environment, and it was Paul Smith gave me the opportunity, and I. You know, I'm extremely grateful for him to do that because it kind of it really did springboard and kickstart a career within football. That I always say to people, I feel like I fell into football because it wasn't. I'm not a football person. I'm not a. I'm not a. You know, an ex player or I, I certainly I'm, I'm not this football person that is my whole life and interest with football, football, football. Um, like I said at the start, I'm a multi sport. Loved every sport, and I think if the opportunity had come in rugby or if it had come in cricket or if it had come in tennis, you know, it maybe would have shaped a different career. But I, I kind of fell into football. Um, and when you get given those opportunities and the doors open for you, you'd be stupid not to walk through them. Um, and that's kind of why my career to date has been predominantly football based um, because of the doors that opened for me and, and at the right times. And I was fortunately a, a lot of the time in the right place at the right time. So were you based in the collegiate campus? Yeah. So it was the wellbeing suite. I think it only just opened um, on collegiate. So I lived on Exel Road. Um, yeah, collegiate, brilliant, unbelievable. What a place to have a, a student hub on the middle of Ecclesall Road in Sheffield. Now, if anyone knows Sheffield, it's the only city, I think, where they put the students on the best road. So you've got you've got beautiful houses with people who are next door neighbours to a, a student house converted into eight bedrooms. And they're probably thinking, I've paid an arm and a leg for this property and I'm stuck next door to eight 20 year old rowdy lads who are causing carnage i've never seen anything like it but it was amazing because yeah you've got all the bars you've got all the restaurants you've got collegiate campus which is brilliant and and like i said you're on this <laughs> the best road in sheffield that is strange isn't it but it's a great campus like what's the the building where physio is because i've been in there loads and it was it was new when i started it's, going there. Uh, robert oh goodness the robert um something building it's the well-being suite and uh yeah. You guys are on the ba basement, you on the bottom floor, weren't yeah. you in there? That's right, physio suite down in the basement, all the seminar rooms, they're the big lecture suite, loads of um, physio couches. The facilities, like I said, that was one of the reasons why I chose it. When I looked around, they were like, right, this is, I think it'd been open about a year. Brand new facility. I thought, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Um, really good teachers, really good lecturers. Um, Miles Butler, I know he lives in Rotherham, um, was inspirational tutor lecturer seminar um really had a passion for physio and i always think when people talk to you about physiotherapy in a passionate way if you if, you know it rubs off on you it doesn't offer uh, make you motivated to learn and, and, and be better and he did that and credit to him he's been at sheffield hallam's lecture there for years now but he was he was amazing so what was it in particular that he would do that was so inspirational um passion um clear passion for his job, clear passion for physio, clear, unbelievable knowledge set, wanted to teach, wanted to inspire, wanted to educate people, um, came in every day with a, a clear motivation to do that and energy. And when people obviously come in with that energy, it rubs off. Um, so obviously on a Monday morning or for me, it was always a Thursday morning after a Wednesday night student night, you know, you don't really want to be there. But if you've got someone who is uh, teaching in that manner, you can't help but learn. So he was he was great. Mm, yeah, no, that definitely is good. So then, when, when you were coming to an end there, you done the placement with um, Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, what happened when you graduated? So I like to think it was a a successful placement. I, I seemed to find a role there, a place there. Um, at the time, the club had just been promoted from League One to the Champs. They were in a bit of a transition. Um, they had, they were the the chairman at the time was Milan Mandrick, so he's the old chairman. The club didn't have a huge amount of money. Um, they were run on a bit of a shoestring. The owner was actively trying to sell. So they had two physios there, Dean Taylor, um, who now works out in Bahrain, uh, worked for the national team there and now has a clinic out there. Brilliant guy. And Paul Smith, who was the head. Um, and when I finished university, I went and worked 
Um, and this is no slant on the NHS. I just wanted to work in MSK. And I went and worked in a private clinic, a really good Anston physio, um, very teaching based, lots of education for a, for a young physio. And I was working in an MSK clinic there um, and always kept in with with Paul Smith at Sheffield Wednesday, um, you know, would help out where I could. Because like I said, they only had the two physios and a masseur, um, Ben Parker. And I think just right place at the right time that because the club didn't have huge financial capabilities, they knew they needed another body. They knew they needed another first team physio, but they probably couldn't go out and afford someone who had vast experience. Because my face fit, because I'd been there for a year, I knew the manager, Stuart Gray. Um, and I think, like I said, I think I'd had a successful time there in the sense that people trusted what I did, even as a young practitioner. I get, got given a lot of autonomy to work with first team players. And I felt like I'd established the, or created a bit of a role for myself within the department. So they managed to find um, finances to, to employ me um, as a first team physio. Um, as a young first team physio and I think that's where I look back on my career and go that was my when when you look at back and go where was your big break where was your big moment that was mine because like I said now don't get me wrong I took a salary which was less than what I could have got in the NHS as a band five I took a salary which was a cut on what I was earning as a, a private physio but it was a stage in my life and career where I could afford to do that and I think when I say about people who were 15 years experienced having to take pay cuts or having to come down the rung or the the ladder to get into sport is almost it's almost impossible if you've got to support families or you've got a bigger picture as a young practitioner i could do that i could take a salary which don't get me wrong and this is where sport is fundamentally you know it it, it shoots itself in the foot sometimes and i'll openly say this i deserve more than what i was given the, the salary wasn't great it's a little bit of a a shame that football and elite sport can get away sometimes with paying practitioners so poorly but they do it because they've got 100 people lined up who will do it for less um because of the industry what it is and but i knew that it was my way in and it was my opportunity to kick start and forge a career in in football so i took that role so i was a, a full time all of a sudden i'd gone from an internship to being given an opportunity as a full time first team physio at sheffield wednesday football club in the championship and the club then massively supported me through that. So I went on a four and a half year journey with Sheffield Wednesday, which took me through, I think, four different contracts on a pay scale. It took me through a change of ownership where I saw the club go from being a um, a club that was looking to just retain championship status to then money like you've never seen come into an organisation. Uh, Chan Siri took the club over um, and players player contracts, player salaries, all of a sudden we were playing, uh, we were signing players and putting them on contracts that would be some of the best contracts in the league. Um, they funded me through uh, my MSc programme um, at uh, Bath University. Like I said, they supported me through four different contracts in terms of getting me up to a level where I was remunerated and paid better than if I'd have been working in the NHS or private clinics. So they really supported me there. Paul Smith was fantastic. He educated me with Dean Taylor um, along the way. So I was, you know, working autonomous with players, leading rehabs, um, speaking to to specialists around the world, going out to to Munich, going out and seeing surgery, going out to uh, speaking to various people who are rehab specialists, just literally as a young, young sports physio, just soaking up all this information. There's me speaking to... Um, Bill Knowles, there's me speaking to Ender King, there's me speaking to uh, Professor Mushavec in Munich, there's me speaking to um, watching Andy Williams operate on an ACL, there's me watching, um, going down and sitting, seeing all the radiological guys doing op dynamic ultrasounds, performing injections, there's me going down to uh, getting paid to go to ice kinetic conferences, go to 40 space conferences, and I'm just literally thinking, oh my goodness, this is an opportunity that I would never have ever got. And this information, all this uh, knowledge is just being soaked up, soaked up, soaked up. I took a player out to Belgium to rehab out there. I took a player, like I said, out to Germany. I took a player, they would go to Vancouver in America to, to work with Bill Knowles. And it was lucky because the club could support me from a financial point of view because we'd just been taken over. You know, when we had players on the money they're on and we we're signing players for multi-million pound deals, the, the resources from a medical and, and science point of view almost become a bottomless pit. Um, and it was amazing. Oh, my goodness. My experience was incredible. 
you know, we went, we got to the playoff final. We played Hull. We lost, unfortunately. But again, young practitioner, I'm sat at Wembley in the Championship playoff final, the most lucrative game in world sport. And I'm almost pinching myself. Um, the next year, we um, we got to the semi final and lost. So it was two successful years back to back. Um, and, you know, that was a four year period, four and a half year period at Sheffield Wednesday where I look back and I go, bloody hell, that was, uh, that was some experience that from opportunity and learning and, and seeing all these practitioners around the world and rehabbing and new facilities, new training ground, new gym, um, you know, travel at matches, at MIF, meeting practitioners, big, building my network. That was another big thing. I'm still on the side of the pitch chatting to like-minded people, first team physios and championship clubs starting to build my network. Um, amazing. Amazing, honestly, amazing. So, you know, you get to sort of your mid-20s and I've ended up having a more experience than probably people who have worked for 10 years because I've, luckily enough, crammed it and condensed it into that four, four, four and a half year period. Yeah, no, it sounds it. It's great to hear how appreciative and how kind of surprised you were throughout the whole thing. But was yeah. it a surprise? Was it or was that talked about that that was always going to be the plan of the progression for you, but also the club? Yeah, so I think that was always my role was going to be was going to be a progressive role where, as my experience grew, I was going to take more and more um, autonomy. When you've only got three physios within a first team, there's always going to be a large proportion of the work you're going to have to share out anyway. Um, and yeah, they, Paul Smith always highlighted that. Look, you're going to work here. You're going to. I'm not going to. You know, you're going to be thrown in the deep end. You're going to be working with players that are senior players. You're going to be rehabbing players. You're going to be expected to travel with the team home and away every week. You're going to be expected to go to appointments at the drop of a hat. This is your role. You are a, regardless of your age, you know, you are a first team physio and you will behave and, 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 and perform like a first team physio. So there was a big expectation and a, and a big pressure on that. But um, yeah, I think I, over that period, there was, there was a lot of success I had with that and an awful lot of learning. And I look back now as a much older, I'd like to think wiser person, but still massively learning. And it's like the Dunning-Kruger effect. I talk about it all the time. It's like the older I get, the less I think I know. And I think when I was younger and I was working at Chef Wednesday in the environment, there's a lot of that. You think you're really good and you think you know a lot. And then as you get older and older, and I look back at some of the stuff I did and I think, oh, my sweet Jesus, what the hell was I doing? Um, and, you know, as I'm getting older and um, I just think, God, I, I know less and less. <laughs> and there's more and more to know and there's more and more I don't know. And that's why now one of my big mantras is to enhance and and p get people into your organisation who are experts and know what they're doing and, and encourage them and harness them and, and make them do their job really well. Um, but yeah, certainly I look back at my, my younger self now and go, wow, <laughs> that was a learning experience. Um, but a good one, a good one. It is funny, isn't it? I've been the same, like this year, just like, I'm like, God, I've learned so much. It's like, what, why on earth did I think that was going to be easy or good or whatever? So it is, it is, it's funny, isn't it, when you think of it? Yeah, it is, it is. And like I said, there are rehab sessions or ideas or I suppose strategies I used to put in place back. At, I look back now and I probably cringe a little bit at, and I go, gosh, <laughs> but um, my God, you learn quickly in elite sport because there is no hiding place. You're accountable to everything. Your responsibility, you're responsible for everything. And um, yeah, you learn quick and you have to grow up fast um, because results and the win at all cost effect is relentless and the championship is relentless and it's not you know kid stuff it's it's proper important outcomes for what your work is so yeah you do have to you have to learn quick have you ever had an absolute bollocking hammering from like management then yeah so oh, let me think um so i think well let me have a think so Carlos Carvajal was a manager I had at Sheffield Wednesday and he hated, um, he hated um, running. He hated this English concept of in rehab, you run. Everything had to be with the ball. It was my first experience of a European manager and European rehab looks very different to, to British style, traditional grass-based rehab. And um, it, was a, it was a very bog standard Hampshire rehab. And I remember 
that's two stories here, but the first one is just, I remember just doing a very typical running drill with a player. And I remember he pulled me in his office after and he just absolutely tore into me and he went, we are not runners. What on earth was that? Like he said, everything you need to do must be with the ball. I don't want to see any of my players running. We are not a running club. And he absolutely tore strips out of me. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is my first experience of a, a European manager and what they expect and, you know, how different they are on the continent to whether it be SNC and gym or rehab. And I walked out of there going, wow, you've got to be able to adapt to what you're working in, still be able to have your key fundamentals and concepts of what you're trying to deliver. Um, and another one with Carver Hull, which was a funny one, which was more of a bollocking off my line manager, which was Paul Smith. I remember I remember a, it was a it was a match day plus one. It was a Sunday when we were in, and I think I was covering the, the, the injured boys. And I had a call off Carver Hull, the manager, and he said, oh, I can't get a hold of Paul. And... I just ended up giving a a debrief of the game and who was struggling and who wasn't. And I think I probably let something slip about a player that was either struggling or something that we wanted to kind of manage in-house as a department. And I remember then sat down on the Monday morning saying, if you ever take a call off the manager and give information like that over again, and it was an absolute stripping down. So, yeah, that was that was a learning curve. <laughs> It is funny, really, because you never really think of like how that you can imagine you would, because like you say, it's so high pressured for everyone, isn't it? I can imagine there's like this is so results dependent and there's like loyalties and all sorts of politics. Oh, my goodness. I mean, football, people will tell you. I mean, I, I transparency and trust within this game is absolutely imperative. I am so fortunate here that I've got amazing staff who I trust implicitly. The culture of good people is the most sole important thing and it definitely impacts on results and success. The minute you get a lack of trust or lack of transparency or you get people with individual ideas or you get people who, you know, want to run, run with their own sort of, um, you know, <laughs> beliefs of grandeur, you, the whole concept falls flat on its face. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I learned quickly that basically the conversation I had with the manager there when um, my line manager wasn't best person. It wasn't necessarily that I was giving him the information. It was more that it was the he wanted the the, the trust and the, and the in-house nature of it to be clear communication amongst us as a staff before we start maybe disseminating information out that may be taken differently or 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 twisted to what we don't want it to 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 be perceived as. Mm, yeah, yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing those. No, it's right. And then, so in terms of your next move. What yeah. happened? What happened when you left Wednesday? So it was a bit of a again. Two things are true if you work in football. Uh, one is that one day you'll die. The second is that you'll get sacked. <laughs> so um, as an entire medical department, things there's a it's a long story, and the bitterness and the and the and the negative side of it is gone, well gone from me now. But the um, we ended at Sheffield Wednesday um, after four years and. The, the manager at the time wanted to bring in some of his own Portuguese staff, which is fair enough. It happens. Um, staff get moved on. So we we all got moved on as a department um, after we lost in the semi-final. I think the manager felt that, you know, there's always in football, and it's a shame that you have, there's a, there's a little bit of a uh, finger pointing culture where people have to be held accountable for failure. And they always try and deflect it off themselves a lot of the time and I think when we lost in that semi-final to Huddersfield the finger seemed to come on to the medical department that if X had been fit or Y had been fit we may have been promoted to the Premier League um, anyway uh, he wanted a cultural change at the club he wanted his own um, people from his own culture to come in and work with him which is fine and it's fine and I've, as I've got older I've realised now that's just part and parcel of sport you see it from top to bottom so we got moved on, but I was lucky that I got a phone call from Rotherham at the time who um, wanted me to come in. They'd obviously, I think, heard about what had happened and heard about the work I'd done. They wanted me to come in and lead the physiotherapy rehabilitation and and, and come in as, as head physio at Rotherham, um, which I jumped to the opportunity. It was a more senior role. It was, it was um, leading rehab. It was leading assessments. It was leading how I wanted the medical structure and, 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 uh, and provision to look. 
it was um, it had the first opportunities for for line management. Um, it also had direct contact with management on a daily basis and with uh, stakeholders. So that was a great opportunity for me. I, I loved that role. Um, Rotherham at the time were in League One. My first year there, we got promoted through the playoffs into the Championship. Um, and second year, we were in the Championship. And that was a great two years for me. Um, really enjoyed it. Again, big learning curve. Um, less place to hide. Decisions are made on my shoulders. Decisions are made with my responsibility. Um, different type of learning curve. Uh, you live or die by the sword and the decisions you make. Um, and yeah, it was great. Different environment, Sheffield Wednesday. Real closeness, smaller staff, real tight-knit group. Had a lot of success off the back of that. Amazing manager in Paul Warren. Um, really, really fantastic to work for. Still, you know, speak to him frequently uh, now. Um, and yeah, then I got to the end of that two years and I got headhunted by um, Nottingham Forest. And it's a great story that we'll go on to now, which again, epitomises football um, and your career in the game. And I had a phone call with Martin O'Neill, who was, it was Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane with the, with the management pair at the time. Um, and they wanted to take me across to lead the rehab at, at Nottingham Forest. Um, which was a great opportunity for me. And I thought, again, it was a club, massive football club, amazing f- facility resources uh, at the time in the championship, but big, big, big plans to move towards the Premier League. Um, great career progression. So absolutely um, accepted the role with, uh, you know, jumped into the role, but left a great role, left a really good job at Rotherham, left on great terms. And what ended up happening in the first week of pre-season, the first week of the job, um, Message on the, my second day pops up on Sky Sports. Roy Keane had left the club. Two days then passes again. Message on Sky Sports News. Martin O'Neill in the first week of preseason had been sacked. And I saw the Greek owner and the Greek sporting director below me in the training ground, escorting what looked like about 10 French staff around the training ground. And I thought, oh my goodness, this doesn't look good. Um, so in came Sabri Lamucci with 10 other staff. Um, to which I was pulled into the sporting director's office and told that I was part of the Martin O'Neill staff and regime and that my services were no longer required, Um, to which I said, I've been an employee at this club for one week. Um, And they said, unfortunately, you are Martin O'Neill staff. When you were employed, he was our manager and we had no intentions of sacking him, but things have changed in the last 24 hours. Um, you're part of Roy Keane and Martin Neal's staff. You, you you no longer have a place at Nottingham Forest Football Club. To which I thought, oh my goodness, I've just left Rotherham, a great job, a great role to come to Nottingham Forest. And I'm now without a job in a really, really terrible position, um, thinking, where do I go from here? Um, and it was just, that's football all over. You have these moments in your career. You have you have these times where, you know, you just, there's not a lot you can do. Um and uh, I was in an absolute pickle. I'll be honest with you. I was thinking, where do I, where do I go from here? So I had a, a phone call at the time from the manager of Bristol Rovers. Called me up. Heard about what happened. Took me down for two days there. Offered me the head physio role at Bristol Rovers. It was just too much of a family change for me at the time. So I, I turned down that role. But I was very grateful um, to Graham Cochrane and staff to to offer me that role. Um, but then Andrew Balderston, who used to be at Nottingham Forest, he was the the head of performance at Hull. He heard about what had happened. He rang me and said, there's a senior physio role going at Hull City. Would I be interested? So I met him for a coffee and offered me the role. Um, So I ended up thinking I was going to Nottingham Forest and ended up in Hull. (laughs) So this this career path, which changes like mad. Yeah, actually, I looked at your progression. I didn't see Forest. So when you mentioned that, I'm like, all right, yeah, I didn't didn't see that one on there. I I don't see the point of ever putting it down. No, I'm not going to put that. It's just a great story to tell people about how things in football are crazy and, you know, you live or die by these crazy decisions. You, your contract's worth as much as the piece of paper it's written on. Um, employment law means nothing. <laughs> Finance rules the world. That's what I would say. So what uh, was it like then? I mean, you've, you've lost your job, but also, like, again, from I'm a big football fan, and the our prospect of going to work with Roy Keane and Martin O'Neill, two absolute legends, that must have been, like, oh, devastating. Yeah, it was it was crushing. It was absolutely crushing. So I've gone from, you know, thinking I've taken a great role, big football club, big responsibility, working with uh, Martin and Roy, big prospects of getting to the Premier League, big player budget, to then that being completely taken from, you know, underneath my feet. 
really in a really poor position because like jobs in football don't come up very often. You know, I was very fortunate again to be to a week later have a job offer from two different clubs. Like that does that's that's fortunate. I mean, it comes through hard work, but you know, I could have very much been in a period there of unemployment um, and the stresses that come with that. So yeah, I was, and I and I'd left a role at Rotherham, which was a great role. Uh, it was an amazing role. I, the manager was amazing. The, the job was great. I loved it. So there was nothing wrong with where I'd come from. I just all of a sudden was in a position on, I think it was the 10th of July, thinking, where on earth do I go from here? Um, but luckily, I was in employment by, I think, the 20th of July. So it all kind of fell into place for me. Um, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that's the merry-go-round of football. And people have all these stories around the game. And it's, it, is, it is football all over. And it's a horrible industry at times. And that's the real ugly side of it. That when I got sat down in that sporting director's office, there's no remorse for my life. There's no consideration of what that might mean to me. There's a check, there's a thank you, there's a, you know, <laughs> away you go sort of thing. And, and that's it. And and it's brutal. And that is sport and elite sport in a nutshell. It's a brutal, brutal industry. Um, and then, yeah, so, but luckily I fell on my feet in terms of accepting the role at Hull, um, moved my family over to Beverly, beautiful place, and had a, a really, really good year there. And, uh, you know, a good football club, um, you know, with uh, a good history some really good staff there and so yeah you just stayed there for the one season yeah so um funny how the merry-go-round works so had a really good year there was really enjoying it had no intention to leave um and about a month before the end of the season um paul warren the manager of rotherham rang me and said look i know you were supposed to leave to go to forest i know the role was you know was 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 great you've ended up in Hull would you come back and work for me at Rotherham they'd just been promoted back to the championship um it was to come back and be uh, the head of medical um would you come back and work with me and I had a great relationship with him um and I sat there and I thought um you know what I loved every day work going into Rotherham I loved working with Paul Warren as much as I was enjoying Hull I felt like I had to it was it was too good an opportunity not to go back, um, and yeah, I, I I I left and I know I'd only been at Hull a year and I, I owe them a huge amount of gratitude for for you know for to Andrew Bolton for the for the role at the time because obviously I was on a, I was in a really bad situation, um, and I, I had a really good year at Hull and I learned a lot and it was a a different environment to learn learning, a different football club, different practitioners. Um, you know, there's a million ways to skin a cat. I learned things off Alan Peacham, amazing physio, really, really, really good. Um, Will Pierce, really bright up and coming physio. Matt Busby, the fitness coach there, head of conditioning SNC coach, learned so much off these people. Um, and it was one of those things I just stored it. Another year of learning in the bank and, and thought, you know what, I've got to go back and, and work for a manager that, um, you know, I've got a lot of respect for. And, and I think he had a lot of respect the other way. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, ended up back at Rotherham, and um, I'm still here now. So my role has slightly changed from the one I came back into. A uh, really good friend of mine, um, Ross Burberry, who was the head of performance at Rotherham, um, has left to go and be a director at uh, director of performance at Lincoln. And again, Paul Warren had the belief in me to to then change my role from just heading up and being the head of medical to being the head of performance and medical. So now kind of taking and and having that ownership over both pillars. Um, and that's kind of what's taking me up to this point as we are now in getting promoted last season um, and now obviously in the Championship. Right, and how have you found the difference in role of taking on the performance as well as medical? Yeah, it's it's um, it's it, it's it's eye-opening in the sense that you're working with um, closely with staff that come from a, a different background. The all I try and do in my role is I've got some amazing staff within the department and I just really want to, I, I never took the role as head of performance and, and, and said, right, I am now an expert in um, the field of strength and conditioning. I am now an expert in the field of on-field conditioning, periodizations, planning, nutrition, all that side of it. That was never my intention. My intention as a person, as a human being was to be um, a leader a department head who could put people in place to give them the autonomy, the license, the freedom um, 
to to really f- spread their wings and flourish within a role. So to bring in Brent Dickinson as the senior performance coach. Now, Brent knows far more than I do uh, from a performance point of view. And I would never claim as his line manager to sit here and be, uh, you know, dictatorship or, or to say, this is how we're going to program. This is how we're going to periodize the, the schedule. This is how we're going to um, train the lads. This is how we're going to work in the gym. Why on earth would I do that when I've got someone who is so skilled, so experienced, who I can try and give all the tools to as the head of department, give him all the resources, give him all the encouragement, belief, motivation, environments come into every day to to flourish within that role. And and, and that's the, the mantra I take on the performance side. I try and set the culture. I try and set the identity of the club. I try and set the identity of the staff. Um, I try and firefight for them. I try and fight for them in, in many different ways. I try and shield them from a lot. I try and take over all the stakeholder communications, uh, speak to the management, speak to the manager, and allow the staff and the applied side on that performance side to just go and do that in the best way they can. And that's where I see my role as head of performance really coming into play. And don't get me wrong, there's an awful lot of learning from that from my point of view, but also... I've always seen myself as more of a performance physio, not a physio. I think when you work in sport, the term performance physio is more appropriate. The two professions are so closely linked. If I'm not working with the S&C guys, if I'm not using objective data, if I'm not coming from a performance strategy in my physiotherapy, you know, I might as well go and work with Joe Bloggs down the road. If I've got, you know, you know, say, for example, I can get an injury back within 10 days to try and make a strategic advantage for the football club but i want to sit there and get him back in three weeks and twiddle my thumbs well there's no fun in that there's no performance advantage there's no there's no um elite sport nature of that style of rehab so we have to come together as a performance and a medical department to really challenge each other push boundaries be really innovative and have a this clear club strategy where we try and support the manager from a football operation the player from a medical and, um, you know, player-centred care, but then also the stakeholders. So it's like this triad that we talk about, where there's the the stakeholders in the finance, there's the the football operation, um, and then there's the player and and the medical side of it. And we try and, you know, bridge that gap between all three. And that's kind of where my role is, as well as still being very applied, um, very applied from a physio point of view, rehab, assessments, um, you know, strategy, how we uh, how we how we might target rehabs, how we might um, you know how we might really try and uh, utilize our resources as best we can to to try and get the best rehab outcomes. How we might enhance the players' programming to try and get the most out of our players. How we might look at our KPIs with the anal- with the analysts and the coach and the manager. How he wants to play. Try and provide him with players that can do what he wants to do. How we might look at that from a you know. A training point of view on the grass to a an S and C point of view in the gym. Yeah, there's a lot to consider there. Like, do you, do you look outside of like the performance and the medical aspect of like your own self development, personal development, professional development? Do you read books? Like, how do you develop yourself outside of being very centered around the medical aspects? Yeah, I think you've got to. I think you've got to be a look at yourself as and become more of a well rounded individual. Um, speaking to people helps me an awful lot picking the brains of, of other practitioners it doesn't have to be within sport it's an organisation isn't it at the end of the day we're, we're, we're Rotherham United Football Club which is an organisation Google's an organisation Nike is an organisation um, as are Manchester City so you know there are leaders there are there are people within each of those fields that you can tap into and, and learn elements from so by listening to podcasts by reading books by, by um, you know all these different resources that in the 21st century, you know, luckily, you know, we have at the drop of a, you know, our fingertips, I, I can tap into, you know, the guys at Apple. I can hear the guys at Google speak. I can, you know, I can, I, I can listen to a podcast. I can, I can look at all these different inspirational leaders and try and draw on their experiences. I can look at my personality. I can, you know, I've taken different aspects of looking at the insights, discovery, personality profile to look at how I can best, manage different types of personalities look at how i struggle with certain personality types how i might have to change my language to talk to other personality types all those different things that i'm trying to self-develop in a leadership role to to try and be a better department lead 
there any particular books or podcasts that you've thought really resonated with you? So that's a great question. So the the Diary of a CEO is a really good one. Obviously, I think a lot of people listen to that and you can get some really good nuggets out of that from um, who, who are your favorite guests of his on that then? So I so there was the I thought the the Dan Carter um episode with, with Jake Humphrey was excellent. Um I thought his the way he talked about his role as a as a key figure in that all black side as the culture of the of the national setup and how their personalities fitted in towards an organization and then their outcome measures. I thought it was absolutely, you know, incredible. Um, I love the way how Sean Dyche spoke um, about how he implemented a model at, at Burnley. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's many, many, many on there that you listen to and you, you take all these little nuggets away and, and you think, wow, that's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, so it's a good one for me to whack on in the car uh, I drive an hour and 10 minutes every day to work. So it's a good opportunity to to put something on and, and have a good listen. Yeah, I've not done either of those two. So that is, there were some really good people on there. And it's the same with the Stephen Bartlett one. There's some brilliant people on there. And it's just, yeah. sometimes there's certain things that you've maybe not even heard of some of them on like the Stephen Bartlett. But it's like, God, that is just such a brilliant point or really well done, really well articulated. Um, but no, I'll, I'll check check those ones out. But I'm conscious you've got uh, you've got your game tonight, so I yeah. um, really appreciate your time on this. It's great. So um, thank you very much for sharing that. Well yeah. done with the the new role, and um, hope you get a good victory in Sheffield tonight. I hope so. Thank you, mate. Appreciate your time. Brilliant. Cheers, Steve. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you.